celebrating our 20th season. From the College by the Lake, meeting the personalities and discussing the issues that affect all of Coeur d'Alene and the Inland Northwest, we are the North Idaho College Public Forum. And now, here's your host and moderator, political scientist, Tony Stewart. Today, we're very pleased to welcome to our program Congressman Richard Stallings, who serves the 2nd Congressional District of Idaho. Uh, he was elected uh, to the Congress in 1984 and re-elected in 1986, 88, and 1990. Congressman Stallings is a Democrat, and he has announced that he will seek the United States Senate from Idaho in 1992. Uh, Congressman Stallings, welcome to the program, and we look forward to dealing with a number of national, international issues in the next 30 minutes. Tony, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Before I introduce our panel member, too, I would also like to uh, thank you on behalf of all of us at North Idaho College for the scholarship that you gave this year uh, to a student at North Idaho College. I know that you give scholarships from your salary around the state, and uh, uh, thank you again. Well, I th th felt that that was an honorable thing to do since I did not agree with the pay raise. I thought that I could either turn it back to the Treasury or let some Idaho student benefit from it. And I think the latter is the, is the wisest way to go. And as always, I'm happy to welcome Janelle Burke, who is an attorney in the state of Idaho, and she is a regular panel member. We shall ask Janelle to commence the questioning. Congressman Stallings, it's a pleasure to have you here today. One of the questions that I know is on everyone's mind across the country is that of the economy, the state of the economy. What do you perceive the state of the economy to be and what would you like to do about it? Well, the recession has been slow to reach Idaho and so a lot of our people have not really felt the impact, although I would say in the Silver Valley, in North Idaho particularly, in some of the mining and timbering communities, they, they've been uh, uh, hit a little harder than they have in the southern and eastern part of the state. But there is a serious problem in the land. Uh, it's taken the president some time to finally realize that we do have a recession. And it's a different recession. It's different than anything else we've had in our history. And this is a recession that is hitting the white collar workers equally. Uh, in the recessions of 75 and 81, uh, we had large numbers of blue collar layoffs. But in fact, the white collar side of the economy was growing. This time, both white collar and blue collar have, have seen uh, job losses. And it, that's why I think it has been such a serious problem nationwide. We in the Congress have tried to at least extend unemployment benefits. There's not a lot that we could do without administrative leadership, but we did try to extend the unemployment benefits. We passed two bills. The President vetoed both of those. Finally, this last month, uh, he agreed with us that uh, the unemployment benefit needed to be uh, there for, for folks who had lost their jobs and had, frankly, run out of options. Um, there will be some discussion of a variety of growth packages, uh, tax cuts, uh, job creation kinds of uh, possibilities. The, the tax cut operation takes a while to be felt. It, it'd be into 93 and perhaps even into 94 before people saw any benefit from that. I don't think that's a particularly wise way to go other than you do get a little spending money into the hands of people that uh, need it such as the middle class. But again, it's, it was a while getting there and I'm not sure the kind of impact that would have on the recession. The other, the job creation takes a considerable amount of money, and, and frankly, we've been robbed. Our generation has been robbed by uh, the 1980s, in which uh, under the Reagan administration, they ran up huge deficits. It used to be that during times of recessions, we could go in and, and spend on a deficit side to create jobs and get people working and get the economy turning. We don't have those options. The deficit this year is over $300 billion. We've tripled the national debt since uh, 1981, and so it is really a frightening prospect that we don't have a lot of options to deal with this recession. We hope that it'll bottom out. We hope that uh, through continued sales uh, internationally, uh, that, that through some, some economic development within our own country, that this will turn around. But uh, I don't see a lot of change uh, in the next four or five months. Congressman, I'd like to talk about this, uh, the session that's just ended recently. And You've already indicated that one of the uh, acts that took place was, yeah. the, after some debate over a number of months, is the extension of unemployment benefits to those people that had uh, expired with their benefits. Sure. Uh, one of the probably major bills that has long-lasting effect over the next six years is the uh, appropriation, I believe, about $151 billion yes. for uh, transportation highways, but I, I also believe maybe even mass transit and so forth. Would you take us through that uh, legislation and the significance you think that that might have? Well, I think it is probably the best job creation bill that we've passed. Uh, again, I, I, 
annoyed that it took us so long to get there because the economy was in the tailspin. Uh, that highway bill, $151 billion, 4 million new jobs. Uh, again, it's mainly a blue collar uh, kind of an approach, but nonetheless, it would have been, been very, very helpful to, to at least ease the pain of this recession. As it turned out, uh, it took us longer to get the package put together. Uh, again, there were threats of a presidential veto. And we would had to accommodate some of those concerns. Uh, this bill is significant in that it takes a new approach. In the past, there were all kinds of federal regs on how the money had to be spent. This particular highway bill gives the states a lot of options. For example, states in the east that are struggling with mass transit problems can use that highway money for mass transit programs, while we in the west, who don't have a lot of mass transportation uh, opportunities and options, can use the money for highway infrastructure, uh, uh, strengthening current highways, uh, just doing a variety of things that will best benefit our own state. And I think that's very powerful and very important because the states really are the best judges of what they need to take care of their own transportation problems. Uh, the bill will be very helpful in a, in a number of areas. Idaho did very well. The amount that Idaho got was in excess of $800 million. And so you spend that over the next five years and, and that will be very, very important. Uh, I made sure that there was some money in for a couple of projects, the Bryden Canyon, project for North Idaho, some money around uh, for Pocatello and, and Caribou counties. Uh, Senator Sims made sure there was some money in for a project out in Limhi County. So the, the state, I think, will do quite well by this bill. But more importantly is that uh, we've got to make sure our infrastructure is, is taken care of because the longer you wait and the more you let those roads and bridges deteriorate, the more costly it becomes to fix them in the long run. In, in, although it, it has that immediate effect, well, I say immediate over the next year of starting uh, some projects that will create jobs, but that has a long-lasting effect, too, when it affects the infrastructure in that yes. way. And, and that's the key part to it. I mean, we're not just filling potholes right. and, and, and doing some cosmetic things to the roads. We're really looking at, at strengthening bridges, replacing faulty uh, sections of road. It's, it's going to be a substantial investment in the infrastructure of this country. And, and as dependent as we are on highways and on, on interstate commerce for food and, and, and just the wherewithal to carry on a day-to-day -day living. It, that's very, very important because once your roads start breaking down, then the, the, the exchange of goods becomes much more difficult and much more expensive. So in the long term, the whole nation will benefit from this highway bill. I think it's, it's a very good piece of legislation. Another issue that's been debated for over two years in Congress, and I know you've had very strong feelings about this, and it did uh, become a reality this year, and that was the Civil Rights Act of 1991. Before that was known as the Bill of 1990. Uh, What's your reaction to... Well, I've, I'm pleased. I, I've got to say I'm very pleased because there are some nasty, racial, uh, divisive overtones that, that's, that's captured this nation. We saw that in the election in Louisiana just a few weeks ago in which David Duke, uh, Ku Klux Klan, Grand Wizard, former Nazi, uh, came very close. In fact, knocked, uh, was, was responsible for knocking the governor, Buddy Romer, out of that race. Uh, we're seeing episodes of, of racial harassment and racial problems through the country. And I think part of it was because of, of some of the, the attitudes that uh, had come out of presidential races. The Willie Horton commercial a few years ago tended to open uh, the floodgates for, for this racial divisiveness. Uh, the, the bill, civil rights bill, was necessary. It did not break a lot of new ground. It merely restored uh, the rights that people had up until the courts made their decision in, in the late 80s. Uh, it merely restored those rights with one exception, and that is we expanded it so that women would have the right to sue for being sexually harassed. It was really a contradiction in, in the sense that a, a black woman could sue if she were harassed because of race, but not because of sex. Uh, this bill changes that. It, it gives women some options, and I think part of it was driven by Anita uh, Hill's testimony before the, House, or the Senate uh, Judiciary Committee in the Clarence Thomas hearings. Uh, part of it was because uh, the President felt some real pressure that, that this civil rights issue was getting too nasty and that he had to take some leadership and, and, and put this thing to rest. Uh, again, we passed it. It was labeled a quota bill, uh, threatened to be vetoed. Some changes were made. They were purely cosmetic because it was essentially the same bill that we passed. He finally came around and signed it, and I think it was a proud day for America because that's one of the things that set this nation apart, and that is that we recognize people on the basis of merit and on the basis of skill and the basis of, of willingness to work, not on a racial or a sexual uh, stereotype that, that puts people in a different class than, 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 than what we would want them to be. And so I, I think it was the right thing to do. I'm glad I voted for it all along. Uh, I think we can still make some improvements there, but uh, for the time being, we have taken a major step towards restoring justice in this country. 
Janelle Berg. I think another of the major concerns that Americans have today is with health care. It has become very expensive, of course, to deal with health problems. Also, with the graying of America, there are more people who need health care. What do you see as being a solution to this national health care crisis? Janelle, of all the issues on the horizon, this one has, has exploded. It's not just something that is inching its way up the, the public opinion charts. It is, it is jumped into number one in, in, on a variety of major polls. It's because we have 37 million Americans without any kind of health coverage. We have hundreds of, of people who may be single parents, uh, maybe farmers, maybe small businessmen that cannot have felt, uh, afford health insurance. And so every day is sort of a Russian roulette, uh, an accident on the farm, a boy falling over on his tricycle, uh, any kind of accident could spell disaster, not just for the short term, for the rest of that family's life. And so the, the nation is moving towards some kind of health care program. Right now there are three different options out there. Uh, the Canadian plan is getting a lot of attention. I don't think we'll go that direction. I think our country is too large and we have too much established already. And by the Canadian system, it's merely a single payer system where the government puts together their own plan and everyone uh, builds the government for the cost of health care, and it works very well in Canada, but where we have such an extensive infrastructure of insurance companies and, and different types of coverages that I think that we will adopt something closer to the European style, which uh, includes such things as employer mandates as well as, as individual options uh, and a government component in there that will provide health care for the very poor and for the uh, uh, folks that, that just can't afford it, even the working poor that can't afford health care. With 37 million Americans uh, struggling without health insurance, when people think that uh, they're not going to have health care, they're, fool they're fooling themselves because they will have health care. It'll be in emergency wards and hospital, which is a very expensive type of health care. It will be when the problem is acute and the cost of, of health care is, is just skyrocketing. We could save so much money in this country just through taking some, some steps to prevent health care. In Idaho, it's, it's particularly serious because we have the smallest portion of doctors of any state in the nation. We're the least doctored state in the nation. And many of our doctors are graying. Not only the mm -hmm. population, as you suggested, is graying, but so are the doctors. And when they leave the small communities, there's no one to take their place. And so it really is a very difficult problem. I think that uh, the election in Pennsylvania of the Democratic senator on that issue, I think that was the issue that, that put him into office, and I think that has got the attention not only of, of the national politicians, but of the White House and of a number of people across the board that we have to move on health care and we have to do it fairly soon. The current system is frankly bankrupting us. It is the most expensive, least efficient, and providing very, very poor health care. We have all the components of having a first-class system. All we need is a little bit of will, a little bit of willpower, and I think that we can do it. And that's certainly going to be an issue I'm going to talk about as we go into this 1992 election cycle. Congressman Stallings, uh, I think you have identified one of the is uh, issues of the 1990s. It will be at the top of the agenda. But close uh, to that issue is another one that we will hear about, I think, throughout the 90s, and that is the question of hazardous waste, chemicals and nuclear waste, and where that's going to take place. It seems that at this point, particularly in the eastern part of the United States, where the population is large and there's a lot of use of energy that has hazardous waste in it, that the idea is to send it west where the population is small and there's not as much political muscle. I know that you, uh, throughout your years in Congress, has, have addressed this issue a number of times. The governor of the state has been uh, probably more outspoken than any governor in the country about uh, whether or not that can come into Idaho. Uh, I have a two-part question. One is, would you give us some background of uh, the issue itself? And two, what do you think its resolution might be in relation to Idaho? Well, Tony, you're asking a historian to give a background uh, <laughs> uh, discussion on, on something like that. You're looking for a 50-minute lecture. If I can interrupt, just want <laughs> to say to our viewers who don't know that uh, prior to being a member of Congress, you were a professor of history at the higher education levels. So, so it, and, and I've already traced this. And, and again, as, as a historian yourself, you, you are very well aware that we're a throwaway society. I mean, from the very beginning, when the settlers came here and saw this tremendous land and resources, and it was just a matter of using what you wanted, then move on to the next. And, not worrying about taking care of things. And so whether it's, it's, it's land or resources or, or minerals, uh, we have, have been blessed with such abundance that, that it's been cheaper just to throw things away and put them in landfills and, and out of sight, out of mind. You know, most Americans put their garbage on the corner and, uh, on, on Thursday nights and Friday morning it magically disappears and we never have to deal with it again. And, and that's sort of developed a, a rather uh, wasteful attitude within our people. We've done the same thing with, with 
waste uh, from plants and from our nuclear industry. Uh, my concern has really been the nuclear waste. Uh, for dozens of years, uh, the Department of Energy has told the state of Idaho that the waste will be sitting out there on the desert, but just temporary, it's just a short time. Finally, Governor Andrews got sick of it and said, you've told us that for 20 years or 30 years, that's enough. We want you to move it. We don't want any more brought into the state. He probably has done more than any person in the nation to get this country to focus on the nuclear waste issue. INEL has literally tons of, of waste, both high level and low level, sitting there on the desert. Uh, it's relatively safe, I mean, unless you have some kind of cataclysmic uh, earthquake or something that would, would uh, put that waste into the aquifer. I mean, it's, it's not going anywhere and the climate out there is not bad, but it's not a good place for it. It's not designed for long-term storage. This country has got to get into recycling. Not only at the grocery stores and, and, and cans and paper sacks, but in all of our stuff. That is the cheapest, the best way in the long term, and I say cheap in the sense of long-term expenditures, to really deal with these problems. We have two types of waste. Short-term, transuratic waste, long-term, very heavy, dangerous stuff. We've been trying to open a facility in New Mexico for the transuratic. We're fairly close to getting a land transfer bill through the Congress that would open that facility, at least for the trial stage. The long-term uh, repository is a long ways off. Its administration is looking at Yucca Mountain in Nevada. The Nevadans are not very happy, which I can't blame them for, but we're going to have to deal with this issue. We have two options. One is that we deal with the waste and we put it in some kind of responsible long-term repository or we close down the nuclear industry. I think that's frankly what the choices are. And if we don't take care of the waste, then we ought not to be generating any more of it. I know that you, in your interest in this issue, talk to experts that really understand yes. the process. And someone approached me with a, an idea that uh, may not be feasible, but I, I want to share it with you, take advantage of the fact that you are in contact with experts. He suggested that he had read some sources that indicated that maybe we could take some of the most dangerous hazardous waste and shoot it with missiles to the sun and that there's all kind of radiation there and it would burn that all up and uh, does that have any feasibility? Or well, cost it's, is great or it's very costly, very prohibitive cost-wise. The other problem is accident. You know, we're having trouble putting small nuclear reactors into uh, things like the lab or into the Mars probe just because of the possibility that, that if that doesn't work and all of a sudden you have this nuclear garbage strewn throughout the northern hemisphere or throughout South America. Uh, the risk factor would be, would be a great concern, but yeah, they're looking at that. That's an option. There's a much more practical option, particularly with the heavy waste, and that is by putting together a, a series of different types of reactors. Uh, there is a, a project coming out of the INEL that, that burns waste as a, a source of fuel. It, it would burn the, the uh, waste from, from the other kinds of reactors, and, and by putting a, a configuration of a different type of reactors into the, into the scheme of things. And frankly, I think you're going to have to have nuclear energy in the future. I don't see any other options for, for long-term power source unless we make some breakthroughs through both fission and fusion. But uh, as it, it turns out, uh, we do have some technologies that could render much of that waste. You're not going to ever get rid of it completely, but you would change it from having a 100,000-year half-life to a few hundred-year half-life, which certainly deal, handles the storage issue much more sanely. Yes. Janelle Burke. This time I'm going to ask you about a question that's close to home. Well, we Idahoans pride ourselves on quality of life, yes. and a part of that quality of life is our wilderness and, and the way that our state has always treasured its resources. Um, what is your position on the wilderness area, and what do you think is going to happen? Well, what I would like to see happen is that we come up with a settlement that uh, satisfies a majority of people, not everyone, you're never going to get everyone right. to sign on, but frankly we have the worst of all scenarios. Idaho has about nine million acres of roadless area that has been targeted by the Forest Service as potential wilderness. Court has said that until Idaho has a wilderness bill, not just Idaho but every state, until that state has a wilderness bill, the Forest Service must treat all of that roadless area as if it were wilderness. So what we frankly have is nine million additional acres of, of de facto wilderness, stuff that, that really is, is not all of it worthy of that wilderness designation, but because it's in this study area, it's so classified. And we have a lot of folks that beat their chest and say, not one more inch of wilderness, we won't do a wilderness bill. And so what they're doing is, is giving nine million acres into this category. And I think that is so foolish because we have timber companies that are in trouble. We have areas that ought to be opened up for, for different types of development. We, ought to, we have areas that ought to be protected as wilderness. 
I would like to see the different parties come together, and I think the state has tried to do that through this uh, negotiation that's been going on. Unfortunately, it seems like it's going to break down. Again, you have people who are, are, are being very petty, I think. Uh, I would take that again as a major goal in the next uh, Congress to try and resolve the wilderness issue. If, if this uh, negotiation process breaks down, I think that they have made some headway, and I would say that in the next Congress that would be the place to start. But uh, you've got to have a consensus bill. We can't have people out on the fringes taking shots at it. Now, like I said, we're never going to please everyone, but I think the timber industry is coming around to the, the absolute desperation that they need a wilderness bill just to, to free up some of this other land for, for some logging. I think the mining companies recognize that it's in our long-term interest. I think some of the farm groups are, are coming around. I think the cattlemen have, have done an about face on this. So we've got most of the players. It's just now to getting them to agree. And as long as they don't agree, we got 9 million acres of wilderness, their worst nightmare. I think uh, they need to realize that this is going to work only when people are willing to, to make some sacrifices for the good of the whole. I know some of our viewers would be disappointed if we didn't engage in international affairs. We've been dealing with a lot of domestic issues. Uh, I know you, uh, again, have a, a real advantage to, to be in the Congress each day and to deal with these issues. There's been a real revolution in the world, this time without uh, a, a world war with what's gone on in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. And um, I guess my basic question is, uh, at this point, and we're taping this program about 10 days before it airs, so that's always risky with what's going on in the Soviet Union, with the speed <laughs> it happens there. Uh, is the Soviet Union going to survive, or are we going to have a lot of independent uh, new countries? It really is a tough question. I think right now they're going through an independence euphoria that you saw where uh, the Ukraine just voted their independence. Uh, you're going to see some other the provinces vote independence. But as, I th as, as time progresses, some of those little states are going to realize there's not much advantage to being all alone in this great big cold world. And, and it's interesting because the Europeans, after centuries of fighting and, and, and maintaining their independence with great uh, enthusiasm, are now moving together to a, a common uh, government. Uh, Europe 92 is, is when they all come together and, and start giving up some of that sovereignty for the good of the whole. And I think it's interesting that the Soviet republics are now moving in the opposite direction to where they're independent and, and will put up their own little trade barriers and have their own little currency systems and, and not give their people a better way of life. I think that if they will, and, and we've got to go through this independence phase, I mean those states have got to show their independence, they've got to, uh, after, after years, centuries of, of uh, being subjected by the, the, the Russians, whether it be the czars or the communist uh, dictators, uh, they, they've been under the thumb and all of a sudden it feels pretty good to be free. I think economic reality is going to come back and say, look, we can't defend ourselves very well. We can't really engage in trade. Most of those republics are totally dependent on one another for, for commerce, and for trade. Um, and so I think you're going to see the Soviet nation go through a process uh, much like what we went through. Just after our independence, each of the 13 states sort of established their independence and thought that was pretty pretty exciting for a while, but it, frankly it, it's just not going to work out. They will find more advantages to being unified if they can come up with some kind of common government. I would think in the short term you'll see some kind of confederation system develop there in which Gorbachev still maintains some control perhaps over the nuclear weapons, perhaps over, over some international uh, kinds of issues, but the republics will develop a lot of autonomy and that will only give way when they see the economic necessity of, of cooperation rather than this, this uh, independence posturing. Congressman Stallings, you know, and I know, I know you just made that comment, that the good news is that a totalitarian system has collapsed yeah. and there was a great threat to uh, the security of the world and we had, to, uh, had so much emphasis on defense because that now that they, there really isn't any uh, major power that's totalitarian in nature that's an immediate threat to the United States, with that in mind, what do you foresee in the next few years as our most important emphasis in international affairs? I think to continue to be the good model, that's where you come back to one of your opening questions, that is uh, the human rights, the civil rights. I think that you can make a case that our spending trillions of dollars for defense is really what brought the Soviet empire to its knees, and, and there may be something to that. But I think what really destroyed the Soviets was the American ideals, the ideals of equality and human value and human dignity. Uh, you can't break that. People want to be thought of in terms of, of a human being with rights and privileges and responsibilities, not in a number that's there just to produce like, like an ant in an anthill. And I think the ideas that we've espoused has really revolutionized the world. It has made 
dictators all over the world, on both the right and the left, very uncomfortable because of the, the notions of freedom and, and human rights that we've espoused. I think we've got to keep that up. I think we, we cannot let our guard down and, and, and start sacrificing some of our own rights. We've also got to reward those countries that, that behave and, and move in the direction that we think it's wise. And we don't have a lot of money. Again, we were robbed by by decade of deficits. But we do have foodstuffs, and we do have technical advice, and we have good people that are willing to go live in those countries in expanded Peace Corps roles. There are a number of things that we can do to continue to set the example and set the model. We're not going to get there by giving away a lot of money. That doesn't really solve it. But we get there by showing American know-how and American compassion and American interest in their problems. And I think with that kind of spirit that we can continue this, this revolution. You're absolutely right, Tony. This has been the most incredible year or two in this entire century. And it has been an exciting time to be in Congress. And it's just unbelievable mm -hmm. to see a person like uh, Havel, Mr. Havel from uh, Czechoslovakia, uh, in prison one day, president of the country the next day, and speaking before Congress uh, a week or two later. It's, it's a marvelous time to be alive and to see what's happening. You got such a vantage point as a history uh, professor. And with that in mind, have, have you read any time in history where the opportunity for democracy is as great no, as it is no. today? This is, this is the most exciting time in the history of this world. Uh, we as a nation are dealing with problems that no other nation's ever had to deal with. Uh, most countries deal with, with hunger shortages. Our problem is dealing with surpluses. Most nations have had to gear up for wars and, and constantly uh, spending tons of money on, on defense. We are going to have to figure out what to do to dismantle our military operation. We spent almost $300 billion this last year on the military. Our next is decision is, is how do we cut back without doing irreparable damages to a number of communities by closing down bases and, and closing down uh, the military industrial complex. It is an incredible time with great opportunities. If only we'd use a little more wisdom a few years ago and, and, and not run up these deficits, we could do wonderful things for our people. I, I think I hear you suggesting also that the fact that the threat uh, has been so lessened abroad, the emphasis or the American people are turning their eyes inward to some of the domestic problems? They are. In fact, we, we have a, somewhat of a disturbing trend here, and that is a little bit of isolationism going on, that people think that perhaps we ought to go back to the 1920s and roll up the, the borders and say we're not going to deal with the rest of the world. We can't do that. I've not been as critical of President Bush as others have because, you know, one of the, the things that he was knocked around for was, was spending all his time on international areas. Uh, we have to continue to, to provide leadership in the world, but we do have to take care of our own. We cannot continue to, to ship tons of money abroad while our own people are going without. We've got to do a better job of taking care of our own domestic issues. And I think that uh, we have the wherewithal, and we have the ingenuity, we have the mind. It's just putting the will and, and, and getting the uh, public behind what we're trying to do. Well, Congressman Richard Stallings, thank you for being on our program. We've covered a, lo a long range and wide range of issues, both domestically and internationally. And we invite you to come back in the future. I will be happy to do that, Tony. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest has been uh, Congressman Richard Stallings from the 2nd Congressional District of Idaho. We hope you've enjoyed our program. I'd like to invite you to be with us again next week at this same time when we shall discuss an important issue. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. The North Idaho College Public Forum was videotaped live from the studios of Telemedia Services on the campus of North Idaho College for viewing at this more appropriate time. We invite you to join us again next week for another all-new edition of the North Idaho College Public Forum on this public television station.